you have a, a Bible, you don't have to stand. Uh, if you, but if you have your Bible and you want to turn with me to Mark, the eighth chapter, and I'm going to read from the message version. So I know most people don't carry around the message version. If you have the app on your phone, you can certainly follow me there. Um, or you can just try to follow me along in whatever version you have. But the reason I'm using the message is I like the way it says something at, toward the end, and I want to use that as kind of a launching point. But Mark chapter 8, and we're starting a new series today called Overcoming the Obsession of Self. Overcoming the Obsession of Self. How many of you know that we are a self-absorbed society? Man, we are, we are all into us, aren't we? And how dare anybody have a different opinion? <laughs> so uh, we're going to try to help some people here today. And here's what it says, if they can help me on the screen there. Now to give you a little, we're kind of jumping in, in the middle of something here, and I know that's a strange place to start reading. So let me give you a little background. Jesus is telling the people who are around him, and he's telling his disciples that he's about to go to the cross, and he's about to have to suffer, and he's about to die, okay? He's, he's about to suffer and die, and he's telling them this. And so here's what he says in Mark chapter 8, verse 32. He, he said this, I don't know what I'm doing. Simply and clearly, so they couldn't miss it. But Peter grabbed him in protest. Turning and seeing his disciples wavering, wondering what to believe, Jesus confronted Peter. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. And calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, Jesus said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. Everybody say, let me lead. I love this. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. I hear that from Rosanna all the time. <laughs> a couple of years ago, we bought a truck, and I never get to drive it. And she says it's her truck. It's a Ram 1500. It's, it's huge. It's big. She's five foot. Well, she's five foot. And she needs help getting in it most of the time. <laughs> Seriously. I had to go buy a running board to put on it so she could step up in. But she wants to drive it, and so I don't do hardly any driving around town anymore. She, she drives me around. I have my own private chauffeur, and she drives me around. And I'm over there trying to tell her certain things, you know, like uh, you don't have to wait till you get right on that person to brake. <laughs> and, and she tells me, you're not in the driver's seat. I am. Jesus is telling these people, you're not in the driver's seat. I am. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. This is not where I want to spend my time. He's telling them, don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Right here is where I want to go. Self-help is no help. Everybody say self-help. <laughs> self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose the real you what could you ever trade your soul for? Amen? I want to preach to you this morning from this thought. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. Look at your neighbor and tell them you're an overcomer. Now look at the one you ignored and tell them you're an overcomer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We want to include everybody in there. You're an overcomer. Every person in this room has... A, uh, I'm, I'm, this is a newsflash. News flash. Now listen, you're going to you're gonna have to stay with me today because I'm going to kind of be all over the place. So I'm just telling you right now, Danielle's home, I'm excited. You're just going to have to <laughs> stay with me. Every person in this room has a life-controlling issue. Some are more accepted by society and by family, while others are more destructive. But everybody's got an issue in here today. And whether your life is hindered by insecurity, or whether it's hindered by selfishness, 
whether you have issues with anger and controlling spirits, whether you battle depression, or whether substance abuse and behavioral addictions are your problem, every single one of us in this room are flawed and broken vessels. Every single one. The scripture says in Colossians 2, 9 and 10, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus. And you are complete. Everybody say complete. complete. You're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Do you understand here this morning that the reason that we struggle is because the moment you entered this world, you came here incomplete. You arrived on the planet incomplete. They just took Ben out just a few minutes ago because he was saying amen and hallelujah. You heard him up here on the front. And, and he was, how old has Ben now? Five months old. And, and I've got a grandbaby that's just two weeks old today. And I got another one coming here in just a few weeks. And, and I'm going to tell you, man, little Avery Grace, she's just the most beautiful thing. And, and I, I hug on her and kiss on her. And, and I tell her, you know, that she, when I'm holding her, she's in the arms of the most important person that will ever be in her life. Because you got to train up a child in the way, you know? And, and so, and I'm telling her all these, and, and, I'm, and I'm kissing on her and all that other kind of stuff. But what I understand is, as, as beautiful as she is, and as perfect as I believe she is, even at two weeks old, she is incomplete. She's incomplete. And you came here incomplete. And the hollow places in your life, they are there, not by accident, but they're there on purpose, because you and I were created to be completed by God. And the problem is not your addiction. The problem is not your other issues. The problem is not your depression. The problem is not your anger. The problem is not your insecurity. The problem is not your low self-esteem. The problem is not any of the other issues that plague and hinder your life. The problem is you were designed to be complete in Christ. And if you try to fill the empty places in your soul with anything other than God, then what you're doing is spending more of your time trying to fill yourself than you are thriving in your life. And so one of the things that I want to get people to understand if they come around and hang around here at the refuge is one of the things I want you to understand the most is you cannot, listen to me, you cannot, look at your neighbor and say you cannot, come on, say it, you cannot, you cannot fix yourself. The self-help industry and very poor biblical teaching and even poorer Biblical understanding has done great damage to the body of Christ. Because we have been led to believe that we have to fix ourselves in order for God to be pleased with us. But that is a lie. That's a lie that we have to fix ourselves. Because listen, God does not reject you because you're flawed and Listen, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to pay attention to me today because I'm going to cross every Sunday school lesson you ever had. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess you up in your mind here today, but I'm going to mess you up in a good way. Because I am here to tell you that God does not reject you because you're flawed and sinful. In fact, God, oh, oh hang on, God does not want you to fix yourself. How can you say that, Larry? Well, I can say that because God has already given us the fix, and his name is Jesus, and he's not going to allow us to go around and try to fill the empty places in our life with any form of self-effort, whether it's addiction, depression, or whether it's good works at the church house. Whew. Every attempt at fixing yourself is a rejection of what God has already provided. Every single attempt at fixing yourself is you rejecting what God has already provided. I think it's very critical for you and I to grasp a real understanding that God does not reject us because our lives are filled with sin. He doesn't reject me because I'm in, involved in some destructive behaviors. He doesn't reject me because I'm really good and I do a lot of good works and, and, and I have a lot of self-effort. He rejects all of those things, but he does not reject me.
What I'm trying to get you to understand is we like to categorize. I'll be over there in a minute. We like to categorize sin. And over here on the bad end is drug addiction and alcohol abuse and I don't know, what, what are we, uh, uh, molestation and abuse and all that's over here. And we, ooh, that stuff's bad. It's bad. It's bad. But I want to tell you that that stuff is no worse than the self-righteous person who only works around the church so that others will pat them on the back and talk about how glorious they are. Because God rejects that behavior just like he rejects that self-righteous behavior. Because God, what God wants you to understand is anything, and that's a big word, anything that you try to put in the gap that only he was meant to fill, he will, he will reject. And he's not rejecting you, he's rejecting what you're trying to put in that space that only he can fill. And the whole point is that he welcomes us. He's not here to reject us. God is not here to reject us. He's here to welcome us. And the whole point of coming boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy in our hour of need is that when we run to him, not only does he welcome us and not only are we received there, but he also begins a process in our life of removing things out of our life that are incompatible with his perfect love. No matter what your Sunday school teacher told you. I, oh, we, we should have sang this today, Leland. We should have sang this. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down and shaking his head. Careful little ears what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down. Be careful little hands what you touch. Be careful little feet where you go. We used to sing that song in Sunday school and I'd get the Holy Ghost every Sunday. (laughs) Because man, when they get to that part, because the Father up above, he's a looking down. They added in love, but I don't think they meant it. Because like it was a guilt song. There was a song. That was in Sunday school. Then we used to sing a song out in big church. Watching you, watching you. Every day mind the course that you pursue. Watching you, watching you. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. Dang, I've never been so scared. And we were made to believe that God is sitting up on a throne somewhere, looking down on us, shaking his head in disgust at our lives. And he's watching us, and he's, man, no matter what you've been told, God is not disgusted with you here today. The truth of the word of God from Romans 5 and 20 says that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. One translation says grace surpassed, increased, and superabounded where there was sin. God, is he may may reject sin, but he is not repulsed by you. He's not repulsed by you. Truth is, light shines clearer in darkness. Truth is, love, the only way love can really be proven is when it can't be deserved. Woo! The truth is, grace drives sin out. It doesn't wait till sin moves out to move in. 
Man, I wish somebody would help me preach today. I might get a little bit wound up. But grace drives sin out. It doesn't wait until it's gone and then decide, well, now that they've cleaned the house, I'll come in. That's not the way grace works. Uh, wherever there is an overcoming issue in your life, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you know that the reason we sin is because we have lack in our lives? That's why we sin. Every sin committed is a person trying to fulfill a need in their own effort. Man. Man. Lord have mercy, I'm preaching so good. I thank you, Brother Stan. I appreciate it, man. Hang in there with me, man. I'm coming. I'm coming. Listen, every time a person sins, it is because there is a lack somewhere in their life, and they're trying to fulfill a need through human effort. We steal because we don't believe God can supply. We lust. We lust because we're living with an unsatisfied heart. Our heart isn't satisfied with who we're with or where our life is. And so we, we lust after people. We lust after things because our heart, are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Our heart isn't satisfied. We're jealous of other people because we're afraid if they get, then I lose. Mm. And when there is a need inside of us, it's because we are lacking. But watch this. Here's you a tweetable moment right here. Temptation stops being tempting when there remains no more lack. Temptation stops being tempting when there remains no more lack. If, if, they, could, if they could throw this scripture up, I'll prove it from the Bible because I know y'all don't believe me. You're just going to believe the word of God. But here's what Proverbs says right here. This is powerful to me when you understand. A person who is full refuses honey, but even bitter food tastes sweet to the hungry. Do you understand that when you are full of Christ, when you are full of the life of Christ in you, man, nothing is as sweet as that. When you are full, you don't have time to be tasting the things of this world. But when you are hungry because there is lack in your soul, even things that will bring destruction to your life sound like they would be sweet in the moment. When your soul is starving, bitter things look sweet. Sin looks like something that will satisfy you. When your soul is starving... Things like bitterness and anger and jealousy and depression. Watch this. Here's where everybody's going to get mad. And every other self-focused, self-destructive behavior looks like it'll fill you and satisfy you. But the truth is those things don't fill you. The only thing that they do is create a craving in you for more of the same. Sometimes we get a reputation at this church. People call us names. I know y'all don't believe that. Oh, the refuge, that's that drug church. Well, okay. I mean, it's not like we're selling them in the auditorium. I don't know. Or I haven't caught anybody yet. I don't know. That does bring up a thing, though. We might need some ushers to walk around. Places I can't see. But we get a reputation, of, you know, for, because we help a lot of people walking out of that stuff. But let's leave, let's leave that crowd alone. Let's, let's talk about you sexual people. Man, you know it's going to be a good service. He said, S-E-X in church. Let's... let's Let's, 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 let's talk about you for a minute because, see, it's not hard to understand that the way a person gets hooked on drugs is they, they do it and they get a feeling from it. And the feeling they get from it creates a craving for more. 
Same thing some of you do with sex. And when you, watch that, watch this. Man, stolen honey is sweet. Hello? But when you start venturing outside God's parameters and boundaries, what you think will satisfy you becomes an obsession for you. And once you participate, because this is how temptation works, when temptation realizes there's an empty place in you, it'll come back because it'll create a craving in you for more. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. That's why men and women both who struggle with sexual sins, if they don't find freedom in that, they repeat that process over and over and over again. And to whoever you yield yourselves members, that's who slave you become. And so when I yield myself to that because it makes me feel good because I am looking to feel something in me, I become a slave to that. And now I'm a slave to the craving. And then it, it breeds all kind, of, all kind of destruction in my life. You need to be careful, man. You need to be careful who you get hooked up with and connected to. In the generation of the great hookup, don't hook up. Is this too plain today? The 9 o'clock didn't get this. They're an old crowd. They didn't get this. I'm talking to you young whooper snappers in here now. <laughs> Listen. You, 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 you don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Because listen, what you're doing is you're opening a door to an insatiable feeling. That'll create cravings in you. And my mother told me this. My mother told me this. She said, when, you, when you're dating and when you're looking for a partner and when you're going through life, just remember this. Remember this. If they'll do it with you, they'll do it to you. Ain't nobody liking me in here today. And what you allow yourself to get involved in creates appetites in you. So see, now what I've done is I've made people mad. So I want to go on to the next subject, which is pity parties. It's a segue right there. Hallelujah. That's what you call it right there. Pity parties are the direct result of you being willing to feast on things that a healthy soul would despise. Pity parties. I want to answer one of those so bad one day. Hello, Pastor. Pity parties. Pity parties are the direct result of you being willing to feast on things that a healthy soul would loathe. Now watch this. What I have found out, don't judge, okay? But what I have found out in two years of changing my diet and beginning to exercise, here's what I found out. Because two years ago, I weighed 268 pounds. Did you hear that? That was one of those moments, Kelly, that was supposed to be in your head, not out loud. Day. The other day, I went, into, I went into my doctor to schedule a procedure that I'm going to have to have done, and the nurse asked him, does he have lard? Wow. 
I looked and I said, did I understand you correctly? She said, no, I said bard. I said, you a liar, you said lard. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm all up in my feelings, man. You're making fun of what I'm looking like right here. I'll be over there in a minute. <laughs> and and what, what I, I've come to understand about this working out process and about changing my eating habits. I weighed 268 pounds. And, you know, now then I've lost like 60 pounds and all that other kind of stuff. And I found this out, that food is fuel. Yeah. Food is fuel. And the thing about food is, it, I, man, I didn't really understand this when I first started working out or I didn't want to understand it. People tried to tell me this before, but I, what, what my trainer began to get me to understand was that, that while chips and Twinkies and lemon-filled donuts gratify my hunger, they don't nourish my body. Come on. And the same is true for your soul. If you feed your soul from your flesh, there will be moments of satisfaction that you will have. But sin and spiritual junk food will never nourish what needs to be built up in you. And what I found out about my eating habits was that what I was ingesting into my system was actually contributing to my breakdown rather than my buildup. And if I wanted to begin to build up some things in my body, I needed to begin to take in the right things because if you take in the right things, it adds to the building up. And some of you need to understand in your spirit that what you are taking in from your flesh is contributing to your destruction and your tearing down. But if you want to get built up in the Holy Ghost, start walking in the Spirit of God and leave your flesh out of it. I'm, I'm going to make some people, I need to hurry. And, and I'm really going to make some people uncomfortable, but filling your soul with a bunch of religious activity is no more nourishing than filling your soul with drugs and alcohol and self-destructive behavior. If somebody say anything. Come on, say anything. Anything that I do through self-effort, whether it's destroying my life with drugs, alcohol, promiscuous living, or whether it's doing good deeds in order so that I can be accepted and recognized, it's still the works of the flesh. And God says, nope. Nope. You see, we've got to figure out if what we're doing is intake or outflow. The way I'm living my life. Am I living my life for what it gives to me? Or am I living my life for what comes from me? And if I'm living my life selfishly for just what it gives to me, then I am living an obsessed, self-absorbed life. How many of you understand religion can't ever satisfy you? How many of you know that religion will never make you acceptable to God? Again, I'm coming against your Sunday school teachers, but I'm telling you the truth. Denomination will not get you to heaven. I don't care if they told you you're the only one going. They lied. And I'm waiting to get up there and find the person that says, Nah, I ain't going in. I, I, they told me they weren't coming. <laughs> We've believed all kind of crazy stuff. Religion can't satisfy. Denomination doesn't make you acceptable to God. And the biggest reason is because God has already declared us accepted through Jesus Christ. And when you try to make yourself accepted by what you are, in essence, what you're doing is rejecting the work of God that what he has done for you. And basically, you're telling God that you can do better than what he has already provided. Sin can't satisfy. Religion can't satisfy. Good works don't satisfy. You were designed for intimacy with God. You are the glove. God is the hand. A glove looks just like a hand, but a glove without a hand in it is powerless. But when you put a hand in a glove, the glove can accomplish the same thing that the hand can accomplish. You were made in the image of God. You look like God, but without God, you can't accomplish anything. But when God moves into your life through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you now can accomplish what He could accomplish because He is living in you. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're acting. So watch. The Word of God uses marriage to illustrate what a life in Christ should look like. When a marriage is healthy, the husband and wife are connected on a level 
that their lives become so intertwined that they actually begin to operate as a single unit rather than two separate individuals. How many of you have ever seen a couple, they've been together so long they look alike? Come on. I mean, they've started resembling each other. You can't, you, can't, uh, you can't hardly tell where one starts and the other one. Roseanne and I have been together so long. This is true stuff, man. We'll be di- driving down the road, of course, her driving. <laughs> driving down the road in complete silence. And out of the silence, nobody has said a word. And out of the silence, we'll begin to sing the same song at the same time at the same verse. And she'll look at me, and I'll look at her. About time you got in this mind. <laughs> she'll look at me, and she'll say, that is freaky. I said, babe, we've just been together so long, we just kind of... Listen. Listen, we've been together so long, I know that if there are certain things people ask me to do, there are some things I can answer without going to her. That's right. And there are some things that I have learned, you better come to me. <laughs> come on. Because we're in sync and there's, like, there's some things I know. No, we're not doing that because mm-mm. She, she ain't down with that. And we operate like a unit. But a bad marriage is when pe- two people remain independent of one another. I made some people mad in the first service, so I'm going to try to do the same thing here. And I'm just, uh, <laughs> it's truth, man. But I'm just going to tell you this. If you go into a marriage and, and you decide that, see, people are going to get mad. If, if, if you keep separate bank accounts in case things don't work out, you've left yourself a way of escape. You've you provided a way for things to get crazy. And I know there's all kind of mitigating circumstances. I get that. I understand that. I don't know every situation, but I'm just telling you, especially for you young folk who are thinking about getting married and all that kind of stuff, when you go into it, baby, you go into it with everything you got. Because if you don't, there's going to be plenty of places to turn around. People ask Roseanne and I all the time, how have y'all stayed together 31 years? Because we're too stubborn to leave. I know they were looking for a romantic answer. That's not it. Made up my mind. Too hard to get this one. Hallelujah. People... (laughs) People with classic bodies don't get lucky twice, man. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Lightning don't strike twice, man. But a bad marriage is when a couple pulls in opposite directions and there's no unity. And in a good marriage, it's difficult to see where one person ends and the other one begins. But in a bad marriage, it's hard to see where the two connect. So... What are you saying, Larry? You were supposed to be talking about overcoming the obsession with self and not self-effort and all this. So allow me to make clear what I'm trying to say and I'm going to be done. But see, here's the deal. God has invited you to get intimate with him. Because he wants to know you in such a way and and bring you into a spiritual life that will flow out of your spirit into your soul, which is your mind, your will, and emotions. And ultimately come out into your physical everyday life where people can see it. But because most of us are focused first on the physical life that everybody can see rather than develop an intimacy with God on the inside, what we have done is we have become physical beings trying to interact with the Spirit of God. And so basically what we're doing is we attempt to visit God on the weekend but live estranged from Him during the week. 
So I come to church and I'm married on Sunday. But I play the field during the week. Because on Sunday I'm saying I'll do what you want, Lord. And on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm trying to fill all the places in my life with what I want. Am I doing okay? Hang in with me for just a minute. I'm almost done. I believe that the reason most of us are frustrated in our spirit life is because we are trying to become an overcomer. And the frustration is coming from the truth (laughs) that you cannot, I know you learned this, The frustration comes, Daniel Dean, when you are trying to become what you already are. And so you are frustrated in your effort to become what he has already declared you to be. Can they help me with my scripture back here? I know you don't believe me, so I'm going to, here we go with the word right here. Next one. Yet in all these things, come on, read. Y'all, y'all, man, y'all, listen. So, so it's a human thing because they they did the same thing in first service. Everybody reads too fast. Come on. Yet in all these things, see, some of you were here first service and you're cheating, (laughs) and that's good because we're helping our classmates. Yet in all these things. Yet in all these things, just read the next two words is all I want you to read. Yet in all these things, we are. We are. That means already established. That means right now in the here and the present. See, and some of you are fighting, trying to become an overcomer. And the word of God said that in all these things, we are. Presently, right now, in the here and now, not waiting on heaven, not waiting on something else to happen, but you already are an overcomer. And the reason you're frustrated is because you're trying in your own effort to become what he's already declared that you are. you got to believe it by faith. Mm. You got five minutes? So, if I'm more than a conqueror, my struggles are already defeated. My addictions, my destructive behaviors are already falling out of my life. But in order for that to become a reality, that's what's happening in my spirit. But in order for it to become a reality in my life, I have to learn to walk out of my spirit and not out of my flesh. So, get for me 1 John chapter 5, verse number 4. 1 John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God, (laughs) for whatever is born of God, oh, y'all are so smart, you stopped on the word, (laughs) for we, for in all these things we are, present tense, are already more than conquerors, whatever is born of the world overcomes come on somebody overcomes the world and this is the victory that has come on has overcome this is the victory that has overcome we are right now in the present tent and we have the victory that already has overcome the world even our faith our faith is the victory that has overcome the world it is not your effort that has overcome the world it is not your self-righteousness that has overcome the world it is not you trying to do better that has overcome the world it is your faith in what Christ Jesus has already accomplished for you that has overcome the world and until you begin to live out of faith you'll never walk in the reality that I am an overcomer right now I am an overcomer I am an overcomer I am I am I am I am am. watch when I'm sorry I'm just walking a little slow get for me Micah 7 please Micah 7 no, 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 I'm sorry. Can we go back? Get for me Ezekiel. I'm, I'm sorry, I skipped. 
Ezekiel. For all of you that think I don't preach out of the Old Testament. God is prophesying through Ezekiel. This is God speaking. He says, I will give you a and put a come on, let's go back. I will give you a and put a I'll take out the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put and cause you to walk in and you will keep to them. Come on, somebody. This is what God is promising. He's, he's promising that there's going to come a new covenant, and this is, this is what it's going to do. And that's not all he does. But see, he says, I'm going to give you a new heart, and then I'm going to give you a new spirit. Watch this. So I get a new heart, and I get a new spirit. Because how many of you understand that when you are saved, it is your spirit that becomes new? We used to sing this song. I know I'm crashing all your songs. Can you just leave that up there for me, Leah, please, for just a minute? Thank you. I, I know I'm crashing all your old church songs, but here, here we go again. Well, I looked at my hands, and they looked new. Looked at my feet, and they did too. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. The night you got saved, it was the same hands, it was the same feet. Because your hands and your feet did not change. It was your spirit that changed. Your flesh remained just like it was. If you came in with tattoos, you left with ta tattoos. If you came in pierced, you left pierced. Your flesh didn't change. It was your spirit that changed. Can I get some help in here? It was your spirit that changed. So he said, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit. But along with your new heart and your new spirit, I'm going to put my spirit in there. And when your new spirit joins up with my Holy Spirit, I will cause you to walk in my way. I'll do it. You don't have to do it. I'll do it. And then watch what he says, Micah chapter 7. Thank you, Leah. Micah chapter 7. Watch this. Who's a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Who does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Watch this. Who will again have compassion on us. Woo. Watch this. And will subdue our iniquities and cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Come on, somebody. So Ezekiel said, you're going to get a new heart. You're going to get a new spirit. My spirit's going to come in on top of that. Come on. When my spirit and your spirit get together, then what I'm going to do is, God said right here, just leave that. He said, what I'm going to do is, then I'm going to subdue your iniquities. And then I'm going to take your sins and I'm going to cast them into the depths of the sea. And I'm going to cast them so far down that they're never going to come back up again. And I'm going to be the one to suppress your iniquities. And when I suppress your iniquities, uh, they'll never rise up to overtake your life again. Uh, because what I'm going to do in you uh, is going to be a work of faith and not of self-effort. And when you walk by faith, God does for you what you can't do for yourself. So, as Leland comes to finish this message, in light of what I just said, let me ask you something. You know, I've been preaching to them a lot today. Let me come over here. In light of what I just said, all that promise that I just talked about, a new heart, a new spirit, his Holy Spirit, him subduing your iniquities, him casting your sins into the sea of forgetfulness so far down that they never emerge again. In light of all of that, can anybody in here tell me what part of that is dependent on you? Absolutely none. Woo. I'm telling you, that makes me want to speak in tongues right now. That makes me want to get in touch with the Jesus living in me. Why? Why does that excite you so much, Larry? Because that means that that big old huge promise is not dependent upon how well I did this week. 
or how poorly I did this week. He just absolutely loves me. Is that incredible? Is that incredible? That's my old man. Like, not my old man. That's my old man. That's who I used to be. No matter how long I've been in this, every once in a while, my old man starts wanting to rise up. My old man. Checking y'all out, man. I need some ushers. Hallelujah. (laughs) My old man wants to get up. Man, I got the Holy Ghost. I mean, like, I got the real Holy Ghost. I mean, like, I got the speaking in tongues, falling on the floor, rolling around. Old time, 1976, Holy Ghost. I was nine years old. They shook it into me, bro. I wasn't leaving until I got it. Not by my choice, by theirs. I wasn't leaving until I got it. Mom said I had enough. (laughs) Get the Holy Ghost. I got it. And ever since I've been nine years old, I find this war in me. That when I want to do good, evil shows up. Don't get all hurt. It's just an illustration. The shoe fits where it's. (laughs) You wish I was back over there, don't you? Good. So, when I would do good, evil's present. And for many years of my spiritual life, when my old man would rise up, my flesh would start fighting. Don't hurt me, I have to have surgery. I've missed a few workouts this last few weeks but my old flesh would start wanting to fight you know what happened every time my flesh would fight I'd lose just like I was doing there I would lose and then I would run to the church because I'd be full of guilt and shame but several years ago when the Lord began to deliver me and free my mind and bring me to an understanding of how much he loves me I began to understand I don't have to do this. And when I would begin to feel my flesh or my old man starting to rise, rather than trying to fight it in my flesh, I'd call on Jesus. And Jesus would just sit down on me. And Jesus would say, I got this. I'm suppressing it. Come on, son. I'm suppressing it. I told you if you'd leave it to me, it'd never rise to cause you any problem again. I told you if you'd let me fight your battle, you wouldn't have to lose another war. I told you if you'd let me suppress it, you could walk in my statutes and be free. But you got to trust me and not you. You gotta trust me and not you. You can't fix yourself. Peter, get out of the way. You don't even know how God wants to work. Self help is no help at all. Everybody stand with me. I'm done. It's all about faith, 
It's all about faith. Sin wants to call you a sinner. Addiction wants to call you an addict. People in society want to place a label on you. But when you let Jesus live through you, you don't even have to fight the label makers. I told you I grew up Pentecostal. Many years ago, the Lord started giving me some revelation about some things that I began to walk out of. And when I began to walk out of those things in the denomination I was a part of at that time, they labeled me a compromiser. And listen, I don't want anybody to be offended, but in the Pentecostal realm, being labeled a compromiser, and they also call me a liberal, but being labeled a compromiser and a liberal was as bad as being called a Democrat in Grayson County. Don't let them kid you in this county. There ain't no balance. Hallelujah. Okay, that's another service. Hallelujah. And I used to fight against the people that labeled me because don't label me. And I'd buck all up and fight. And the more I fought people, Bradley, the more my ministry suffered. Because you know what I was doing? Rather than focusing on people who God was sending me to reach, I was trying to defend my own character and my own. And so God backed up and said, if you want to do it yourself, go ahead, but you're, it's going to come to nothing. And when I realized this isn't benefiting me, and I realized that if I let God fight the battle, Goliath was standing out calling all kinds of names to David and the people of Israel. And he said, I, David said, I, you come at me with a spear and a sword, but this isn't my fight. I'm just coming to you in the name of the Lord. And when you start realizing you don't have to battle everybody, when you get over yourself, and I really don't know exactly who I'm talking to here today, but I'll tell you this, the scripture says if you'll walk in the spirit, you'll never fulfill the lust of the flesh. And as you learn to walk in the intimacy with God, you won't have to fight your life controlling problems. Because God, what God wants you to know is I've rendered those problems useless and powerless. And if you'll trust me, I can overcome what you could never overcome. In fact, I have overcome. And all you need is faith. 